everyone to this episode of Heterodox History on the Ukraine, how the Ukraine became just Ukraine, a brief history. I can already see uh, someone in the chat uh, mocking my idea of a brief history, which goes from 1187 until 1991. Well, I mean brief in the sense that I'm going to keep it very concise in the broad scope um, of the chronology we're going to cover, it is certainly a very ambitious topic to cover. But given recent events and given many people's interpretations that I have seen and discussed, I think it's important to have an understanding and narrative of placing Ukrainian nationalism, Ukrainian identity uh, within the broad sweep of history. Because in terms of looking at this as a region, um, the Ukraine, in terms of the borders it currently occupies, is already, you know, one of the most significant areas in Europe. It is the home of the Pontic Steppe. Um, Indo-European civilization started really around the Ukraine and uh, southern Russia. Um, it was host to the Scythian Empire, it was host to the Sarmatians. Um, and then, of course, it was host to the Slavic peoples. However, um, to avoid me covering too much detail that I've already covered elsewhere on this channel, um, I hope that this episode will serve as a nice addendum to a long, uh, long running series I have going on called Orthodoxy, Autocracy and Nationality. If you want to see my video with um, the rest of the gang on uh, the formation of a Slav sort of identity and the Kievan Rus, I've included that in the description. Also, I've included my episode on the formation of Muscovy and the Mongol invasion, if you want to learn more about the things covered. So in terms of, again, understanding this uh, idea of Ukraine and placing it into relation with uh, especially Russia's uh, relationship to Ukraine, uh, given what's going on at the moment, um, I think it's important to have a brief overview of what essentially was the first great break in the civilization of the Rus or the Russias, um, which is a, as a result of the collapse of the first Russian civilization in the medieval era and its subsequent conquest and invasion by the Mongol Empire. Um, just again, to, quick, to quickly summarize, the, uh, the Rus were founded in the ninth century. They established uh, two major cities, Novgorod in the north and Kiev in the south. And in the beginning of the 11th century, as a result of contacts with the Byzantine Empire, um, Vladimir the Great established a sense of Rus Russian national identity um, linking all of these territories. And I have several maps here. There's going to be a cacophony of maps uh, for the rest of this evening, uh, linking this uh, vast territory, which is uh, covering more or less the modern borders of uh, Ukraine in the north, Belarus, and uh, Western Russia. Um, so, as always, you know, this is the sort of scope of uh, Rus civilization. But unlike what happened elsewhere in Europe, the territorial integrity of the Rus as a civilization was never very cohesive and it collapsed almost immediately after being founded and Christianized by Vladimir the Great. Um, he partitioned his empire among his 12 sons. One of those sons successfully was able to briefly reunite the empire, uh, Yaroslav the Wise. Um, but then he <laughs> took the very wise decision of um, introducing a succession system uh, called the rota system or the ladder um, based on, you know, systems elsewhere used by the Vikings, whereby um, if another male occupied one of these now 12 uh, principalities of the Rus, um, many sort of cities I'm going to mention again, but significantly we're talking about uh, Haliac, Ryazan, Chernigov, Smolensk, Kiev, of course, Novgorod. Moscow doesn't feature into this account at all at the moment. Um, there is a hierarchy of principalities until one arrives at becoming Grand Prince. Um, but nevertheless, this had a natural sort of uh, inbuilt incentive to commit genocide, sorry, to commit uh, regicide and uh, fratricide um, in order to uh, climb up the ranks of this. And uh, this led to almost instant uh, civil wars. And uh, interestingly enough, Kiev lost its uh, preeminence rather early on during this uh, early collapse of the Kievan Rus civilization uh, to be replaced by Vladimir Suzdal. The state would ultimately become eclipsed by Moscow. Um, Vladimir Suzdal sacks the city of Kiev, and thereafter it is Vladimir, not Kiev, which has the, uh, the preeminence among all the Rus principalities. Nevertheless, as you can see on this map, um, the Rus civilization, uh, the Slavic civilization, only ever occupied the northern part. In the southern part, the Pontic Steppe, 
Um, this has been host to many uh, various tribes. I've already mentioned the uh, the, period, the eight tribes of antiquity, the Sarmatians and the Scythians. We have the Gok Turk Empire. We have the Khazars. We have the Pechenegs. And um, coming around this period, we also have the arrival of the Kuman Kipchaks, a tribal confederation who dominate the steppe and what is now the southern borders of the modern Ukraine. And um, as the Kievan steppe uh, begins disintegrating, um, we have to think about the prospects of all these Kievan principalities uniting in some form of a system of defense um, against would-be invaders, because of course they will be conquered in about 50 years' time. And it is with this respect to this ongoing struggle between the Rus people and the people of the steppe that we arrive at the etymology of the Ukraine, because of course this lecture is the idea of the Ukraine turning into Ukraine. And again, there's also a subtle difference in etymology between uh, Ukraine, Ukraine, and Ukraine, and whether that again is indicative of what essentially means a borderland or a nation. And the first reference we have to an idea of Ukraine comes from about the, it's assigned to the year 1187, and it's from a index called the Hypatian Codex, which is formulated during the 15th century, and it's based on various 13th century uh, Rus records and manuscripts. And the Codex refers to the Ukraine as the very specific territory of the Principality of um, Pereyaslav, um, south of the major cities and principalities of Kiev and Chernigov. Um, and this Principality of um, Pereyaslav occupied essentially a position as the frontier um, between the major Rus cities and the Kuman Kipchaks. And therefore, taken as a concept of a borderland, a Ukraine would roughly be analogous to a mark in Germanic language, like that of a Brandenburg. Um, consequently, there were many Ukraines. While the whole territory of um, Pereyaslav is referenced as the Ukraine of the entire Rus, segments of other principalities, such as Ryazan, were possessed of their own border regions, Ukraines. But as a whole, these territories did not constitute Ukraines in themselves. In the 1930s, after the aftermath of um, colonization or indigenization, um, a policy pursued in the Soviet Union, uh, there was an attempt to distinguish this idea of Ukraine as a borderland or principality or nation. And this really sets up the, the scope of this uh, conversation, because I want to discuss the, the break in the, uh, the division, essentially, between the, the South and the North and the conquest of the South, first by the Mongols and then by the uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, how the North is able to set up a new Rus power base and become Moscow, which is estranged from the original heartland in Kiev. Progressively, we'll go through the collapse of Poland and Lithuania, the territorial rise of Russia, their defeat of the Crimean Khanate and the Turks on the north side of the Black Sea. And then we'll talk about the very concept, the 19th century concept of Ukrainian identity compared to other names such as Ruthenian, uh, Malolosia or Little Russia, and how these ideas developed in the Austrian Empire, which is where Ukrainian nationalism really arises, and within the Russian Empire itself, and how this uh, reaches a peak, essentially, when we have the establishment of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, uh, which also demarcates the boundaries of the modern state of Ukraine, which did not exist before 1945. So as back to this, I'll give a uh, brief summary on the uh, the great tragedy which beheld uh, Rus civilization and leads to this, uh, what I will refer to as a civilizational break. Um, of course, in 1206, Genghis Khan unites the Mongols into a single people, uh, taking a title as universal ruler. That's literally what Genghis Khan means. His real name was Temujin. And after attacking you know, Chinese dynasties, the Chia and the Jin, Genghis launched a brutal attack on the Khwarezmian Empire in Central Asia, which more or less would have corresponded to uh, Iran and the Soviet republics in Central Asia. And after the total conquest of this empire, uh, Genghis sends his best general, uh, Subutai, um, into a raiding expedition into the Caucasus in Georgia. It begins as a reconnaissance mission, but they successfully annihilate the Georgian army. Um, the armies then go north um, across the Volga. They attack and they destroy an army of the Kumans um, and the Kipchaks. They sack the major city of Astrakhan. 
And they, as the Kumans regularly sort of raid the Russian lands as part of this ongoing struggle where the concept of the borderland comes from, the Rus, of course, didn't intervene to deal with this greater threat of the Mongols. Um, however, the Rus did organize a coalition of these various princes you can see, Halyech, Kiev, Smolensk, and Vladimir Suzdal. Uh, they organized an army which was decisively uh, defeated at the Battle of the Kalka River. Uh, where Subutai kills roughly 50,000 Russians, decimating its army and the ability. Essentially, that battle is like the um, Rus Russian equivalent of uh, a Agincourt or a Cressy. Um, the Mongols don't sort of encroach here, but they've laid the groundwork for their future invasion, which takes place under Ogadai Khan and his nephew Batu Khan. Um, he's given the order to conquer the Rus with some 40,000 men. He destroys all of the remnants of the Kuman Kipchaks. Um, he reaches the outermost city of Ryazan. He destroys it and then leads the conquest of the greatest of the Russian cities after Kiev, uh, Vladimir Suzdal. Um, and of course, this had occupied the position of preeminence among all of the Rus principalities. Um, so after the destruction of Vladimir, um, we see again the, the killing of the, of the Grand Prince himself and the sacking of major Russian cities, such as, and again, Rus, Russian, the distinction here isn't so obvious, but almost historically, because Rus and Russian almost mean the same thing, it's almost like a historical demarcator in that Rus refers to a civilization which is almost continuous with Russia, but because of this historical gap, therefore one has to differentiate between Rus and Russian, but ultimately it's the same civilization with this great breach in the middle of it. Um, Rostov, uh, Tver, Gelish, uh, all of these cities, except from the great city of Novgorod in the north, were destroyed. Um, after taking the steppe, the Crimea, uh, the Mongols then destroy the cities of Chernigov and Kiev um, until they arrive right at the extreme borders of what we would now consider Ukraine. And then they go even further, they attack Hungary, and they cross over as far as Croatia and Bulgaria. Uh, thereafter, the invasion stopped as a result of the death of the great Khan and the subsequent Kurultai. But significantly for this, the the son, uh, sorry, the nephew who was orchestrating this campaign, Batu Khan, establishes his own power base in Sarai, which in Persian means the court. And it's from there that uh, the Mongols essentially take over the remnants of the Kuman Kipchak uh, Khaganates. And they use it essentially to rule and extract resources from Russia. Now, into this system, post the Mongol conquest and the devastation of the Rus principalities, uh, we have two figures which I want to talk about, which is um, uh, King Daniel of Halych of Ruthenia and Alexander Nevsky. I'll talk about Nevsky first because he was the son of the Grand Prince who was uh, first to submit to the Mongols. And he became very quickly the Prince of Novgorod. Um, as the Mongol invasion was happening, he was leaving Novgorod and he was able to defend it against an incursion both by the Swedes and later by the German Knights of the Livonian Order, essentially attached to the Teutonic Order, uh, during something which was uh, encapsulated by, I think it was uh, Sergei Eisenstein, uh, the Battle of the Ice and the composition by Prokofiev. Um, and after this, he established you know, his, his legacy, his mantle as the defender of uh, Russia against um, Western encroachments. Of course, this was just before the, um, th this was, yes, someone in the chat is mentioning, yes, this is Stalin, this is just before Operation Barbarossa. Um, in the aftermath of the, the essentially the destruction of Rus civilization um, and having dealt this defeat to Western conquerors, Alexander Nevsky made the interesting decision to surrender Novgorod and the city um, to the Mongols to avoid destruction. Um, thereafter, Alexander Nevsky essentially acted as the, uh, the proconsul, the vice regent of the Mongols, acting on behalf of Batu Khan um, down in Sarai, which is no nowadays sort of closer to uh, Volgograd, which was, used to be Stalingrad. And he essentially acts as the supreme ruler of the Rus on behalf of the Mongols until 1463. Why am I talking about Novgorod? Because it's here and with his dynasty, Alexander Nevsky, that we see the beginning of a Russian consolidated state, which is allied to the Mongols in the north, that will be the basis of a revived uh, Russian civilization, which will carry on from Moscow. Um, because again, you know, um, he's willing to collaborate with the Mongols on the one hand, but it preserves an element of Russian civilization that will eventually go on 200 years later to defeat them. Um, and again, 
what was the alternative which we'll discuss the alternative was to ally instead with the Swedes with the Teutonic order the Livonian order uh, convert to Catholicism uh, submit to the Pope and uh, whilst Alexander Nevsky was submitting to the Mongols he was prepared to preserve Russian Orthodox civilization which is key in terms of this conception of Moscow especially as the third Rome um, after his uh, after his death, essentially, of his successors, it is the youngest son, the most unassuming, uh, Daniel, um, who would restore the Rus to prominence and power through their power base in Moscow over subsequent generations. And as you can see on this map, Moscow expands you know, quite exceptionally over the course of 200 years. And this becomes the power base for the modern center of Russia and also why it's sometimes derisively known as Moscovy. Now, returning here to what was happening in the south in Red Ruthenia, or you know, essentially the uh, what is now the further westernmost enclave of the modern state of Ukraine, um, we have the Kingdom of Halych Galicia Lodomeria, which is also periodically known as the Kingdom of Ruthenia. Um, this state had put up a far more active resistance. Um, it had risen to prominence some 50 years before. And it was in the direct path of um, the Mongols, and they briefly submitted to Mongol authority in 1246. And however, unlike Alexander Nevsky, um, Daniel, the ruler of this uh, principality of Halych, Galicia, and Lodomeria, allies with the West consciously in opposition to what Alexander Nevsky did. He submits to papal authority and is rewarded with it with receiving the title of King of Russia or Ruthenia. Ruthenia Et the etymology of Ruthenia is significant because it would come to signify the first demarcation against Russia, albeit gradually over the course of the ensuing centuries. Ruthenian or Ruthini is literally the Latin designation of the Rus. Um, although the word is essentially the same, the emphasis on Latin is to indicate a part of the Rus people that had become subordinated to secular and ultimately religious Catholic rulers. Um, therefore, it is the use of Ruthenian is often again designated of foreign usage or Western usage, um, because all of these you know, terms essentially mean the same thing, which is of the Rus. And it's only in the late 19th century that we begin to see a serious sort of a distinguishing marker against this idea of us all being part of the Rus. In 1256, uh, Daniel is defeated, um, having kept them at bay for a short amount of time. Um, and essentially his sons thereafter collaborate with the Mongols um, and try and actually attack Poland and other states um, and the dynasty essentially in Galicia and the, the kingdom of Ruthenia um, amounts to nothing. Um, Lithuania uh, comes out of nowhere to become uh, one of the great states of Europe, something which is seldom ever mentioned, but it's incredibly significant to understand in the concept of Ukrainian history. Um, because whilst the Mongols are destroying the cream of Rus civilization, the center of Rus civilization, what is now Ukraine and the Belarus and Western and Southern Russia, um, Lithuania comes out of the situation as relatively secure, intact, very militaristic from its own wars against the uh, Teutonic order over its religion. And the Lithuanians under Vitenus and Gediminas are able to expand into these essentially, you know, devastated, depopulated regions, uh, virtually unopposed. And one by one, the once great and powerful cities of the Rus, which have been devastated by the Mongols, uh, fall to the Lithuanian encroachments. And by 1362, by 1349, the kingdom of Ruthenia, the, the so-called kingdom of Ruthenia, the kingdom of Russia, uh, which had established, again, they set the precedent of standing against the Mongols, allying with the West, and ultimately fails, unlike what happened with Novgorod and Moscovy. In 1362, Kiev itself falls, and the forces of the Mongols, the forces of the Golden Horde, are decisively defeated at the Battle of the Blue Rivers, essentially transferring the overlordship of all of the southern Rus people, or Ruthenia, this idea of Ruthenia, from the Mongols uh, to the Lithuanians. Um, there's, there's one little note which I, I brought up in one of my previous lectures, which is the religion of the, the great ruler, the great grand duke of the Lithuanians, Al Gerdas, um, because he's disputed, interestingly enough, he actually appears on the, the Russian national monument, which was to indicate a thousand years of a continuous Russian statehood, um, because nominally he was supposed to have converted to Orthodox Christianity from Lithuanian paganism and taken vows and taken the name of um, Alexius, 
and therefore some Russian historians refer to him as a orthodox ruler. Nevertheless, you have contrasting accounts of him referring to um, particularly the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople, referring to Algardas or Alexius as a fire worshipper and a demon who martyred Christians. So there was a lot of conflicting evidence around there. And 19th century Russia, especially from a nationalistic point of view, was uh, home to some very strange ideas in terms of the origins and religions of uh, uh, certain peoples. Um, after him, the dynasty that takes over under the Eugelio, they convert to Catholicism, uh, which is fundamentally crucial. And Poland and Lithuania, as a result of this conversion of Lithuania to Catholicism, join in to become essentially one state. Um, well, not one state, but really an alliance of two states um, in opposition to the Russians. And from the, you know, the 14th century, um, so, sorry, through to the 18th century, this uh, union of Poland and Lithuania is one of the great powers in Europe, which is ultimately snuffed out during the partitions of Poland, which is another important thing that we'll get to. Um, and it's again, during the, the last sort of great conquering hero of the uh, Lithuanians uh, was the Grand Duke uh, Vytautas, who was essentially ruling Lithuania on behalf of his cousin, uh, Eugelia. He takes the cities of Smolensk, of Kursk, of Poltava. So this isn't just expanding into Ukraine, this is also expanding into Western Russia. Um, and he gains the first access of Lithuania to the Black Sea as well. And therefore, he is really the first ruler, you know, post the disintegration of the Rus civilization to unite most of the territory of Ukraine. Uh, but this time is not under Rus rule, it's under Catholic Lithuanian rule. Um, meanwhile, Poland was now ruling over her Orthodox subjects in Haliac in Galicia, Red Ruthenia, the heartland of this uh, former kingdom of Russia. Uh, he would have gone further were it not for a, a disaster against the Mongols in 1399. Um, and his conversion to Catholicism had the effect of sidelining most of the Rus Orthodox boyars or nobles from significant positions of power in their own lands, uh, with integral Rus principalities such as Politosk, uh, Smolensk, Chernigov, and Kiev under Lithuanian, uh, under Lithuanian rule and Haliac under Polish rule. Um, and these would represent the bulk of uh, Ruthenian territories for the next four centuries. Um, whilst Vytautas has been unable to conquer the steppe, um, instead the, the Golden Horde or the Empire of uh, Batu Khan begins to disintegrate. And one of these rulers in the uh, disintegration of the, uh, the great Mongol sort of successor state of the Golden Horde, Melek Jere, founds the breakaway state of the Kipchak Crimean Khanate in the middle of the 15th century, uh, which would eventually establish its capital at uh, Baksasari. Um, and the people of the Khanate will become known thereafter as the Crimean Tatars. And invariably, the state could also be referred to as a uh, Tataria. Amidst a succession struggle, the Ottoman Empire established, and again, the Ottoman Empire based in Turkey, which had in 1453 taken Constantinople. Um, they established a presence in um, the Crimea, as you can see in Yedazan, the region around Odessa, um, in Azov, which is now, you know, Rostov and the Don. Um, and the Crimean state becomes a subordinate ally to the Ottomans. Um, nevertheless, they're essentially taking over the old sort of Byzantine possessions, the theme of Curzon, and the territories which the Slavs had never ruled. Nevertheless, it is here, the Crimean Khanate and the Ottomans um, establish a alliance, a system, whereby the backbone of the Crimean economy was slavery. And they would routinely rage into the Polish, Lithuanian, Ukraine, and Muscovy. And it's estimated, though, again, always be historical of claimed numerical figures in history, that around 20,000 slaves on average were taken from the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth alone, not just not to Moscovy, Russia, just the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth um, and their parts of Ukraine every year from 1474 until the 18th century, with the last major slave raid occurring in 1769 before the Russian conquest of the Crimea. Returning to Poland and Lithuania, around the same time as the formation of the Crimean Khanate, Moscow was consolidating under its Grand Prince Ivan III, incorporating Novgorod, becoming the undisputed leader of the Russian people. Now the Rus found themselves united and at once divided for the patrimony of the Moscow Prince, who would later become the Tsar of Russia, only included the north of the old Kievan Rus', 
the remainder of the Rus people had been conquered by the Polish and Lithuanians from the 15th century. And here we see the institutional use of the term Ruthenia, Red Ruthenia, denoting the former Kingdom of Galicia, also known as the Kingdom of Ruthenia, which had been incorporated into Poland and in 1434, uh, it was created as the Vovodeship or the Principality, the Dominion, uh, the province of Ruthenia. Uh, white Ruthenia was a term applied to the areas conquered by Lithuania around Minsk and Polotosk, the origin and Vitebsk, the uh, origin of the term Belarus, literally white Rus. Um, the use of colors is a potential relic of the Mongol conquest, as the Mongols divided their respective hordes into colors based on cardinal directions. Uh, the use of color, I think, here confuses our picture of Ukrainian nationality, especially given the conflicting usage of said colors, say, for example, by Alexander uh, Giagini's uh, description of the European Sarmatia. And again, Sarmatia is um, a common usage of um, this sort of terminology, this term from antiquity, Sar Europea Sarmatia, this uh, region corresponding to uh, Poland and essentially everything to the east of it. Um, in the account by uh, uh, Giaginini, uh, he would refer to Moscow as White Russia, and he would also reference a Black Russia, um, though there is no consistent indication of where this Black Russia was supposed to be. And often it's used interchangeably with the territory of Red Russia, which is also um, Polish Russia or Polish Ruthenia. Um, and again, there were also a small selection of Ruthenian peoples, the Urusin peoples in the Carpathian mountains in what was the Kingdom of Hungary, but is now the Carpathian reaches of the Ukraine. A uh, quick note on the language. From Old East Slavic, the language of all the Rus, Novgorod quickly became the intellectual center of Russia and Moscow adopted elements of the Novgorod dialect, whereas Ruthenians taken as a whole were gradually susceptible to the impressions of the Polish language uh, with some Turkish borrowings. Uh, so it's almost universally considered that it's during the 15th century and the 16th century, uh, partly as a result of the political disunity in the Rus, the fact that the North and East is controlled by Orthodox Moscow and the South and West is controlled by Poland and Lithuania, that we begin to see a divergence in the dialects between these two groups. It has been said that the expanded use of the term Ruthenia um, was con contrasted with the use of the term Muscovite, referring to the denizens, the Tsardom, indicating a departure in identity, though this was almost always considered a deprecating term, that being Muscovite. From the reign of Ivan III, the princes of Moscow had utilized the term Tsar, formal formalized, and again, that means Caesar, Basileos, Emperor, formalized with the coronation of Ivan IV in 1547 as Tsar of all the Russias, and in the West he was known as the Emperor or Imperator of the Ruthenes. Ruthene was a universalism, indicating more the foreign nationality of the user of said term, for both Rus within Poland-Lithuania and Russia used some iteration of the word Rus, from Ruthini to Rusaki, etc. Note also the political implications of Western authors using the term Muscovite, so as not to acknowledge the title of Tsar of all the Russias, which had once elevated a heretical ruler, if you're a Catholic, um, to the equivalent status of the Catholic Holy Roman Emperor, uh, which was incredibly controversial and even contested when Peter the Great adopted his title of Emperor of all the Russias, whilst it also presents a claim, a territorial claim, against the Catholic king of Poland and the Grand Duke of Lithuania, who reigns over so many of the Russias that we're talking about. If you look at this map on the left, this is a religious demarcator between Orthodoxy and uh, Catholic Poland, although it's not perfect in terms of the economic, uh, sorry, the, eth the ethnographic sort of descriptor of the state. You know, there is some Catholics in Grodno and uh, Western Belarus, and there are some Catholics in Galicia. More or less, this territory in green uh, corresponds to the territory which could be considered part of the Russias or in the West, using the Latin term, Ruthenia. By the end of the 16th century, Russia was in political disarray, while Poland-Lithuania was consolidating and expanding. Under King Sigismund II of Poland and Lithuania, the, state, the two states were united as a joint state under the condition that the Commonwealth become an elected monarchy with privileges for the magnates or nobility called the Golden Liberty. Under their Swedish king, Sigismund III uh, Poland, 
uh, of Poland, the reforms of the Catholic Council of Trent uh, became a bastion of essentially the state ideology, and therefore Poland became a Catholic bastion um, against the contrast of the Protestant Reformation, which has taken hold in Sweden. And actually looking at uh, Sigmund III Vaz is very interesting because he began as King of Sweden and was essentially deposed in Sweden because Sweden had become a Lutheran state and he wanted to convert it back to Catholicism. Instead, he was elected for King of Poland and here he led the Counter-Reformation despite becoming uh, coming from a uh, Swedish dynasty. Under his reign, uh, uh, Russia was at its lowest ebb. The time of troubles were a period where, briefly, uh, Russia was forced into a personal union with Poland. It was achieved briefly uh, before the rise of the Romanov dynasty. The Polish began backing the uh, various contenders to the throne, uh, you know, usurpers uh, and people pretending to be the uh, the son, uh, the deceased son of the former Tsar Dmitri. Uh, there were three false Dmitris, and then eventually the Polish gave up the pretense of wanting to place one of these imposters on the throne. And uh, the son of Sigismund uh, was declared Tsar of all the Russias with the expectation he would unite Russia and uh, Poland, Lithuania, and also make Russia Catholic. Uh, but he was thrown out of the Kremlin in 1612. And in 1613, the uh, Zemsky Sobol, the States General of the Russian of the, of the Russian state, elected Mikhail Romanov as the new Tsar and heralding the slow consolidation of Russia before it would eventually come to eclipse uh, Poland, Lithuania. Uh, nevertheless, despite uh, Polish aspirations, the bulk of peoples considered Ruthenian within the borders of the Commonwealth itself, i.e. now the vehemently Catholic Commonwealth, remained Orthodox, as you can see on this map on the left here. Um, however, they were not originally Russian Orthodox. Moscow, since the Union of the Churches, and again, the Union of the Churches is this old thing dating back to this brief moment in time between the 1430s and 1453, uh, during the Council of Florence, when the uh, Eastern Orthodox uh, Church in Constantinople tried to unite with the Catholic Church to win allies against the Ottomans. Um, it didn't succeed, but this legacy um, of the union of the churches continued, and the stain of it uh, very much affected Russia's religious identity going forward. Um, because Mo uh, Moscow, since the Union of the Churches took place, um, interestingly enough, part of the process that resulted in the Byzantification, the elevation of Russian as imperial identity, uh, was a royal wedding. Um, and that royal wedding was actually used by the papacy to try and bring Russia into the fold of the Catholic Church. And instead, the royal wedding resulted in the complete rejection of that, the consolidation of Russia's imperial identity under uh, Ivan III and uh, Vasily III which is uh, uh, all the more fascinating. Um, so as a result of this, Moscow is essentially hostile to anything resembling oversight from the Catholics. And this is incredibly um, consistent with Alexander Nevsky and all the history which has been established since then. But moreover, also to prevent interference from the Ottoman Sultan who controls the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople um, in Constantinople, which is now the capital of the Ottoman Empire. So the Mo Church of Moscow aspires to increased independence. So whilst at the time that Moscow is becoming more independent, um, and they had their own metropolitan, uh, a metropolitan, in Greece it's confusing because the metropolitan is lower than the archbishop, but in Russian orthodoxy, a metropolitan is essentially like a national primate akin to like, the Archbishop of Canterbury to you know, try and use some form of comparison there. So whilst the Russians have their own metropolitan, Kiev uh, also has its own metropolitan, um, again, who is abiding by the jurisdiction of Constantinople. The Muscovites have their own metropolitan and both claim jurisdiction as the primates of all the Rus peoples. So there are essentially two metropolitans, one in Moscow, one in Kiev, claiming the same authority. And in the 1580s and 90s, Moscow's metropolitan was elevated to that of a patriarch of the same rank as the patriarch in Constantinople as one of the chieftains of the church, um, along with the Pope, along with Antioch, along with Alexandria. And um, it is with this idea, again, it's the it's the idea that this was also consented to by Constantinople, um, that the Metropolitan of Kiev was deposed. And this, prevent, this presents a interesting opportunity for the Polish to exploit. Now there is disunity within the Orthodox Church and there is resentment from the bishops against the Muscovite Church. Sigismund III capitalizes of this development, this demotion 
of the Metropolitan of Kiev, the promotion of the uh, Metropolitan of Moscow to Patriarch, um, to essentially raise his own appointment, his own Metropolitan, uh, Michael Rojosa, who concludes something known as the Union of Brest, which establishes, and that's a city in, uh, I forget, a city in uh, Western Lithuania. Uh, which establishes, and this is the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, uh, which establishes the Ruthenian Greek Catholic uh, Church, or the Uniate Church, um, under the ecclesiastical authority of Rome, whereby Sigismund III could extend some of the Catholic Tridentine reform to his entire realm, at least nominally. Um, while at first the Polish king had support from some of the Orthodox bishops who had joined in this union of the churches, um, and the king had made some concessions regarding the creed, such as the filioque, the idea of the relationship of the father and the son to the Holy Spirit, and the idea of introducing the Gregorian calendar versus the Julian calendar. Um, the attitudes of the Russian Orthodox towards the Union were very much quickly soured because they perceived this as an attempt by the Catholics to undermine the authority, essentially all their religious practices, their rituals, their holy calendar, their way of life, and also accelerated with this idea of the Catholicization of the Orthodox population, is this idea of Polonization coming along it. I mean, these are two ideas which are going to increasingly prop up now. One is Russification, and one is Polonization. And Ukrainian identity, as much as we can talk about it here, is very much forged in opposition to these two ideas, these two, um, assimilating influences of Russia in the East and Poland in the West. But one of the groups which is most opposed to this union of the churches, this Orthodox church within uh, Poland, Lithuania, becoming part of the communion of the Pope, um, are the Cossacks. Now, the Cossacks arose as a Slavic militia patrolling the no man's land between the Commonwealth, it's called the Wild Fields and Tataria. And the reason I mentioned and put so much emphasis on the slave trade earlier is that the Cossack states arose in opposition to the slave trade. They essentially acted as a patrolman or sheriffs, you could say, um, in the, the fringes of the, uh, the borderlands of uh, Russia and Poland um, when they met with the Pontic Steppe. Um, and they had, in, in terms of trying to understand their territory, we're talking about the, the region of um, uh, Zaporizhia, which essentially means literally beyond the rapids, the rapids, the river Dnieper. Um, and their controlled territories were something called a sich or a fortress, and sichi, which means camps. Um, their government was a sichrada or fort captaincy. And they, because of the, invariably, there were many Germans um, who were operating and traveling throughout this territory, acting as ambassadors, but also setting up manufactories and being merchants. Um, interestingly, there was a crossover from the German language in the fact that this idea of the captaincy occupied by the chief Cossack, uh, uh, he became a Hauptmann, uh, which in German means captain, which was essentially came over as Hetman, uh, which then bec thereafter became the title of the leader of the Cossacks. The Cossacks were renowned as great warriors, and they often fought a continuous losing battle uh, against the, um, uh, the Crimeans and the Turks. And eventually they had to submit themselves to Polish rule under the provisional government, uh, Polish government based in Kiev. Poland affected a policy of Polonization with the Polish Catholic nobility establishing vast estates over the modern territory of Western Ukraine. Increasingly, the devoutly Orthodox Cossacks resented the rule of Catholic Poland and their hetman, uh, Bodan uh, uh, Klem uh, Klemlinitsky, led an uprising which took control of Kiev from the Poles, ironically, with the tentative backing from their mortal enemies, the Crimean Tatars. The rebellion was aimed chiefly at achieving autonomy from the Polish aristocracy and the Catholic Church. Um, uh, Kemlinitsky did not have the legitimacy to found an independent state and so appealed to his Russian co-religionists to repair the ground for the Cossacks to defect from Poland to Russia, which he achieved. Russia declared war on Poland as part of what would later become a great disaster for Poland known as the Deluge, where they would be occupied in the east by Russia and the west by Sweden. In return for Russian aid and protection, uh, Kemlinitsky swore allegiance to the Tsar and gained autonomy in the Ukrainian left bank and the Zaporizhia. It is here where the idea of Ukrainian nationality is often described as originating, neither Russian, nor Polish, nor Tatar, but something in between. 
Etymologically, it has been claimed that Ukrania or borderland became Ukrania from the same root of Kaj, meaning country, but in the, in the late latter sense referring to a principality or even a nation. Note how this vassal state was established at the historical center of um, Pereyaslav, the capital of the first designated Ukraine. The emphasis being that Kiev, once again, became an independent center of orthodoxy with its own metropolitan. The state of affairs post-1644 with the Treaty of Pereyaslav, um, which is essentially acted as the reunion in some cases of um, the Rus patrimony, the little Russian patrimony with the rest of Russia, or in some cases, the beginning of an independent Ukraine. Um, it's claimed as both, and both an inception of Ukrainian nationhood and the reunion of the ancient capital of the Rus, Kiev, with an extended Russian nation. After Bodan's death, the host, and again, it's important to note that it was never called the state of Ukraine. It simply was a Cossack host which occupied the position of the left bank Ukraine or um, eastern Ukraine, um, became increasingly subordinate to Russia. And with the conclusion of hostilities between Russia and Poland, the host was not consulted on their new border. The host was divided with a northern, northern host on the east banks of the Dnieper under Russia, while the southern Zabor uh, Zaborizhian host was divided between Poland and Russia as a condominium, essentially the two states sharing rights and sovereignty over another state. Kiev, rather than becoming a national cultural center opposed to Moscow, exemplified this notion of reunion as Kiev's intellectual sense and its Polish influence began to have a marked effect on the Tsar's court and the church, directly setting the stage for the Petrian reforms and the abolition of the Moscow Patriarchate. And if you want to learn a bit more about that, I did a lecture a couple of days ago and I will be having a discussion tomorrow. Without the leadership of Bodan, the Cossacks turned on each other in a period of civil strife known as the, uh, known as the ruin of the, uh, the ruin of Ukraine. The southern territory was briefly occupied by the Ottomans and then by Poland again. Ivan Mazepa briefly reunited the host, the image on the right here. But under Peter the Great, the Cossacks allied themselves with Sweden during the Great Northern War under the pretext, and again, this is part of this ongoing struggle between them, um, Russia and Sweden over domination in the Baltics. There is also the war spills over into Poland. And um, it is the idea that the reason why the Cossacks had re joined into this reunion with Russia um, is because they are seeking protection. Uh, that's why they originally went to the Poles to uh, gain protection from the Tatars and they were betrayed. And Ivan Mazepa is using the same logic um, now that the Polish under the Swedish are attacking. He believes the Russians have abandoned their uh, sworn commitment to protect the, uh, the Cossacks. So Ivan Mazepa uses this as a justification to go over, side with Charles XII of Sweden, and both of them are defeated at the conclusive Battle of Poltava. Thereafter, the host's authority becomes nominal. Uh, real authority was placed under a Russian governor in Kiev, and Ivan Mazepa's own supporters were executed, and he died in the same year. The position of Hetman was abolished at the start of the reign of Catherine the Great. Thereafter, the region became known as Little Russia, uh, Malodosia. The southern Zaporizhian Sich or fortress state was annexed in 1775 by Russia, coinciding with the partitions of Poland. Now, again, for more detail on this, because I don't want to rehash what I've already uh, said on this channel, uh, do check out that lecture where I go over um, Catherine the Great and her uh, partitions of Poland. But to put it briefly, the state of Poland-Lithuania had been in decline progressively due to the uh, lack of any authority from the central government, the power of the magnates, and this idea of the liberum veto, whereby in the Polish parliament, any one magnate could veto the entire policy of the state. And this meant essentially that the magnates were invariably bribed or acting on behalf of foreign interests. Um, by the close of the 18th century, Prussia in particular is wanting to dismember and control parts of um, Poland and Lithuania. And my contention essentially is that um, the Russians are duped into this uh, first uh, partition of Poland, uh, whereby they begin to cut into that territory in Belarus. The Austrians gain Galicia Lodomeria, which is going to be significant, we'll come back to later, and the Prussians take over West Prussia. And progressively, another two series of partitions from 1793, um, from 1793, the, the Russians gain essentially what would later become the Soviet border 
between the Second Polish Republic and Russia. And in 1795, the Russians gain not just most of the Rus uh, principalities with the exception of Galicia and Lodomeria, they also gain the Courland and they also gain Lithuania, uh, Catholic non-Rus peoples, which had never been part of any sort of uh, Rus nation or Rus uh, state. Um, and again, just important to note that this wasn't the unification of all the Rus, the, uh, the heartland of Red Ruthenia, the former kingdom of uh, the Russians, which had been established during the medieval period in opposition to the Mongols. Um, this heartland was joined with Austria. Uh, thereafter, it will become part of the Austrian Empire, and then as part of the Austrian uh, partition of um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The partition of Poland was subsequently justified by Catherine the Great, as a great orthodox repatriation to Russia and the reunion of many of the states of the former Kievan Rus, reuniting many of the Eastern Slavs into a single state for the first time in about 600 years. There is also the point to consider that Russia annexed non-Kievan territories. And again, it's also important that there are economic factors regarding this. Uh, one of Catherine's chief concerns was the maintenance of serfdom. And Poland, Lithuania proved to be the main source of escaped serfs. Um, so that was one of the motivating reasons for the partition among these uh, uh, more sort of nationalistic aspirations. Um, and this is where we need to come to the distinguishing ideas of Russia, because now we're moving beyond this idea of Ruthenian within the Russians, within the Russian Empire. Um, to distinguish this idea, we have core Russia. And Core Russia is where we get this idea of what would later become the self-designated Great Russians. This is a term which is older, it sort of comes around from um, 1657 onwards with the reunion or the uh, Treaty of uh, Pereyaslav in uh, 1654. And this comes from an older Byzantine description of the Megali Rossiya, uh, which is a Byzantine description of this territory of the Great Russians in the North. Uh, meanwhile, the Ruthenians, no longer the Ruthenians because that descriptor, that differentiator is useless and because they are no longer under some sort of Catholic Latin patrimony. The Ruthenians within the Russian Empire become the Little Russians in modern day Belarusia and the, sorry, in Ukraine, uh, Malorussia and the White Russians in Belarus. And it's to this that I'm going to talk about the situation of the Little Russians and the White Russians uh, with, and uh, this idea of New Russia um, throughout the existence of the Russian Empire. With the defection of the Cossacks to Russia, uh, Tsar Alexis has styled himself as sovereign of all the Rus, the Great, the Little and the White, terms which have become popular in the 17th century and patronized by thinkers like Gazelle and even used in the correspondence of Bodan um, Kamelensky. So this was an idea that was actually used by uh, uh, so-called Ukrainian clergyman and the founder of the Ukrainian nation refers to himself as a Little Russian not as Ukrainian. And when you're looking at one, this topic has been one of the most difficult to research due to the fact that there is no sort of um, consistent national history because of, um, again, there has been sort of no Ukrainian state until 1991. That's the demarcator for this point. Um, but it's the fact that when you look back historically, um, you're always conscious of using terminology. Well, I am at least, because I want to be a thorough, which people at the time would have recognized and understood. So you always have to differentiate between historical demarcators or historical contrivances and how people would have actually referred to themselves. And the idea that uh, Bodan uh, Kemalitsky would have referred to this idea of Ukrainian, Ukrainian as a nationality as opposed to a regional denominator, the fact that he came from the, east, uh, the eastern half of Ukraine or the left bank of Ukraine has to be emphasized. Little Russia began in this uh, east bank of the Dnieper as this geographic descriptor. And then it becomes briefly this Russian governorate of Malorossia, Little Russia, until its abolition in 1781. Uh, meanwhile, Russian conquests would finally link the majority of what is now Ukraine, uh, save Galicia, into a single state for the first time, uh, which up until now, uh, Ukraine had been divided by Slavs in the north, Tatars occupying the Pontic Steppe, or in Russian, the Stepovina. In 1764, Catherine the Great founded the Governorate of Novorossiya in anticipation for the Russian conquest of Turkish and Crimean possessions on the northern Black Sea coast. From 1768 until 1774, the Turks were decisively defeated, and in 1783, 
Crimea was annexed, precipitating another war which Tur uh, with Turkey that Russia also won. After the conquest, Catherine and her marshal and lover Potemkin oversaw the peopling of the Stepovina, the majority of the colonizers being Romanians and Little Russians. The term New Russia was made as a conscious imitation of the fellow great powers of the time and their colonization efforts, whether it be with um, Massachusetts um, in, uh, as New England or whether it be uh, New Spain as Mexico. Um, of course, it would have very unlikely referred to uh, Canada as New France because it had been taken by England at the time. Nevertheless, that was the conscious association that it was going to be Russia's great sort of uh, colonial enterprise. And in terms of the great span of history, by 1851, so 80 years after the original conquest, 70% um, of the two great cities which were founded um, uh, in these first sort of waves, uh, Curzon and Odessa, um, uh, their population was about 70% uh, Little Russian. Um, other cities founded during this time include Mariupol, Sevastopol, Simferopol, Krasnodar, and Novorossiysk. Uh, the naming conventions of cities such as Odessa come from Odessos, which is um, an old uh, Greek appellation. Uh, Curzon and Tarida were Greek and Byzantine in their connotations, Curzon in particular, referring to the ancient theme where the Byzantines used to rule. And this again, like calling her state Novorossiya before she conquered it, was consciously designed in anticipation for the fruition of her Greek plan, which was to unite Russia with the former Byzantine Empire and take Constantinople. Of course, this never happened. The administration of new Russia at the beginning of the 19th century would become divided like that of Malorossiya. Crimea, for example, would become the Taurida governorate, uh, and the governorate and the rural parts of the region of New Russia would come to speak uh, uh, Little Russian, while the major towns would invariably speak uh, Great Russian or Russian. In Crimea itself, the Tartars retained a significant presence. Outside of Little Russia and New Russia, there were the governorates of Podolia and Volina, uh, which sometimes were grouped together with the parts of the Polish partition, known as the Pale of Settlement, uh, which consists of West Russia and the area around Minsk as well. And I have an image of this idea of the Pale of Settlement on the East, uh, which is often taken in reference to Jewish history. But the idea of the Pale is also useful in denominating essentially all of Russia's gains um, post around the time of... Um, Catherine the Great, with a couple of exceptions where we're talking about uh, uh, East Bank, etc. Right. The term Little Russia in particular was synonymous with those who spoke the modern Ukrainian dialect, which by now had uh, begun to diverge from the Belarusian, from the broader Ruthenian dialect, which we talked about earlier. As the 19th century progressed, historians and folklorists such as a uh, uh, Kost, uh, Kostomarov, a biographer of Bodan Kamalensky, um, began to differentiate different nationalisms and histories to that of the Great Rus and the Little Rus. Having found the Little Rus Revival Society of the Brotherhoods of St. Cyril and Methodius, Cyril and Methodius also coincidentally are the, are the creators of the Glagolithic alphabet, which would be the predecessor of the Cyrillic alphabet, um, alongside uh, Taurus, uh, uh, Shevchenko, uh, one of these sort of great uh, patrons, literary patrons of um, of early sort of uh, this idea of an early sort of Ukrainian revival before even the notion of Ukrainianism or Ukrainophilia. Um, he associated the Cossack movement as a historical opposition to Tsarist autocracy, in particular the Norodnik movement or Friends of the People, which advocated a form of agrarian populism and local collectivism. Nevertheless, the Brotherhood's members, including uh, Kostomarov, uh, were all pan-Slavists. So while they were particularists, they were not opposed to the union of the Russian people or the East Slavic people, uh, nor would they use the term Ukrainian. Uh, Kostomarov, for example, utilized the term Ukraine as a borderland distinct from the idea of nation. Nevertheless, the Russian government disbanded the Brotherhood, whose ideas were utilized by the uh, Horomadas or the traditional peasant assemblies. While there were little Russian particularist underpinnings, the cultural circles of the Horomadas were consistent with the peasant obsession by the Russian intelligentsia. Compare the Norodnik adjacent movement in Ukraine, uh, the Klopomania, with the more radical national aims of an organization such as the Young Poles. 
um, Poland had been incorporated, essentially core Poland had been incorporated, as you can see on this map on the east, uh, post the Napoleonic Wars. Um, before on the previous map, Russia didn't have to deal with the larger section of the Poles. Now that after 1815, this was no longer the case and Russia was responsible for them. Um, and Poland began as, this, when, I'm, when I'm bringing in the Poles all of a sudden, is because there were, on the one hand, there were conservative czarist elements that were concerned that the Narodnik adjacent Ukrainian sort of uh, uh, sympathizing movements would soon begin to advocate independence. But they weren't concerned that necessarily for the idea of Ukrainian independence, such as it existed at the time, but they were more concerned of a general uprising of the Poles and all the people associated with Polish culture, the Polish historical connection, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which sums up this territory of the Pale of Settlement. Poland had begun nominally as an autonomous region within the Russian Empire as Congress Poland. It rebelled um, in 1830 against the Russians and consistently lost their rights. And during the January Rising of 1863, um, around 200,000 men rose up against the Russians in Poland uh, with various Lithuanian support groups and little Russians and white Russians supporting them. And this is significant because this also had international backing from Italy, Garibaldi in particular, uh, France and Britain. And this had domestic backing from various revolutionary organizations such as Land and Liberty, uh, which would later become, for example, uh, the organizations which would coalesce into those responsible for the assassination of Alexander II in, uh, 16, in, in 1881. Uh, and again, the aims of this, ostensibly from at least the Russian perspective, were the restoration of, was the restoration of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The conflict over the Little Rus identity vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Poland, the idea of independence from both, is exemplified in the figure of uh, Volodymyr Antonovich, a member of Polish nobility, born in Kiev, founder of the Triple Society for Polish Independence, who abandoned that cause at the beginning of the January Rising, changing his name and converting to orthodoxy to be among the Little Rus peasantry as opposed to the Catholic Polish nobility. So again, there's also a class element uh, which is associated with um, Little Russian nationalism. Uh, the January Rebellion was crushed. Tsar Alexander II then turned his attention to organizations he believed were culpable, such as the Holomodas, uh, closing them down and suspending their publications. Um, a little Russian translation of the New Testament was vetoed by the Russian Orthodox Church as potentially subversive. When the Imperial Geographic Society of the Russian Empire published works on Little Rus e um, ethnography, um, this was done by Mikhailo uh, uh, Dramonov, um, the Tsar appointed a commission to examine the separatist elements within Little Russia and responded with the Ems Ukas, which banned all books, newspapers, plays, etc., in the Little Russian dialect. The severity of the Ukas was relaxed somewhat with the Yakarzia of um, 1881 and further with the Russian Revolution of 1905, which brought in Russia's first attempt, failed attempt at a constitutional monarchy. The Ukas was never repealed while the empire existed up until 1917, and elements of little Russian nationalism or Rus nationalism uh, seldom pervaded beyond a clique outside of um, Kiev. Uh, Mikhailo Dor uh, Dormanov, meanwhile, was taking up the cause of little Russian nationalism internationally, which would eventually transform into what we'd understand as Ukrainian nationalism. And this is just a map on the particular on the left. This is a, a series of Polish maps I found, one indicating the uh, the idea of the Ruthenians as altogether in this uh, co corresponding to uh, the Kuban region, uh, the Belarusian region, also parts of the, uh, the region south of Rostov, um, and of course into Austria as well. And uh, sorry, yeah, Hungary. I thought there's an interesting map on the elements in the east talk about this idea of sub identities of the Ukrainians um, within uh, Ukraine itself. Uh, but these, this map on the left here is uh, significant for what I want to talk about next. In the first partition of Poland, Galicia, um, Glodomeria, um, which was both a Catholic and it was also a uh, Greek Catholic or Uniate province of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, um, it was ceded to the Habsburg monarchy, which would later become the Austrian Empire. At first, the Austrians afforded rights to the Greek Catholic Church and even afforded it with a metropolitan, 
placing the Austrians in good stead with the Ruthenians compared to their former Polish masters. And um, it should be noted that whilst the term Ruthenian post the partition in Russia becomes redundant, uh, Ruthenian becomes the classic demarcator for the next hundred years of these peoples. Um, and again, the Ruthenians essentially transferring their, they believe they're transferring their Polish masters from their, uh, to their new Austrian masters with the partitions. After the failure of the Polish risings against the Russians, many anti-Russian conspirators found themselves in Austrian Galicia, orchestrating the insurrection of 1846, which was put down thanks in part to the loyalty of the Ruthenian peasantry and the German bureaucratic class, the Habsburg dynasty. Nevertheless, the rights of the uh, the rights the Austrians had afforded the Galicians uh, led to a Ruthenian revival through the publication of folk, song, uh, folk songs and tales in the Ruthenian language, the nymph of the Dniester being an example. Uh, Ruthenian aspirations were focused on achieving parity with the Poles, but increasingly the Poles would come to dominate the administration of the Kingdom of Galicia, though they were unable to touch the Greek Catholic Church, the central node of Ruthenian particularism. When Austria was given a federal constitution and Galicia its own diet in 1861, diet essentially meaning a parliament, the Ruthenians were able to reach some form of parity in terms of numbers with the Polish delegates. Yet without a sizable elite class, their concerns were trampled over by the Polish aristocracy, who during the 1870s achieved virtual complete autonomy from the central Austrian government so they could run the province on their own. This elite Polish faction were known as the Podolians against the populist Ruthenian faction. The government was forced to offer the Ruthenian language concessions in 1890, turning Galicia into the main flashpoint for Ruthenian nationalist aspirations. It should be noted that the appellation of Ruthenian, again, sorry, I've already mentioned that point. Um, although autonomous, uh, Galicia's electoral system was routinely rigged by the Poles to prevent a Ruthenian takeover of the government. While Polish parity remained a consistent and unrealized goal, to which um, Drahmanov uh, bemoaned, as some, or, and again, he refers to this as uh, some idea of a uh, uniate Paraguay within the empire, um, Ruthenian goals began to diverge into two significant directions. The first one is to Russophilia. Uh, Russophilia in Galicia was consistent with this idea of the pan-Slavist movement uh, within Russia. Uh, in particular, Pogodin had a profound influence on the thought of uh, Galician Ruthenians. Uh, historians in this province, such as uh, uh, Denis uh, Zobritsky, uh, led this process, linking Galicia's history to the kingdom of Ruthenia. The Ruthenians and the Russians were, to him, the same people. Their Russophilia led them to support the Ems Ukas, as Russia was essentially an aristocratic language, a unifying force uh, um, against what the Ruthenian nobility perceived as the peasant little Russian dialect and all of these Sophia, uh, socialist sort of political aspirations, connotations associated with that movement. There were broader political considerations in the language policy. The fact that the little Russian dialect, again, was supported by um, the little Rus uh, particularists, uh, the Horomadas, the Norodnik adjacent peasant advocacy groups, um, all of these would coalesce into the Ukrainian nationalists. Nevertheless, the Russophiles did at points have major peasant support. Essentially, the Russophile position among the uh, peasantry was that the Tsar could be seen as their protector against the arbitrariness and the tyranny of the local Polish and Jewish elites in Galicia. Now, the second divergence is to this idea of Ukrainophilia. Um, this, the success of the Ukrainophiles and the corresponding relative decline of the Russophiles was due to, first, the flood of radicalized um, little Russian intellectuals from Russia into Galicia following the Ems Ukas, um, no longer again espousing little Russian particularism, but anti-Russian, anti-Ruthenian, Ukrainian nationalism. The Galician language reforms, which I'd already mentioned from 1890 until 1893, um, again, this is interesting because it more or less represents Austrian tacit consent for the development and the rising power of the populists and the uh, Ukrainophiles. Um, signify because again, Russophilia is a bit of a dangerous uh, force if you're going to permit it within your territory because you're essentially wanting your population to ally with a foreign power in order to affect some sort of change domestically, which is never a good thing for any nation to do. So uh, Ukrainian nationalism, therefore, uh, as a tool to be used against Poland, essentially the divide and conquer, uh, half the population is uh, 
uh, pro-Pol, half the population, anti-Pol through this means of Ukrainian nationalism. Um, it's actually quite a clever tactic from the Austrians, rather than allowing half the population to rely on a foreign power to intervene on their behalf. Uh, when we're talking about, and again, the final point to mention is the effectiveness and organization of uh, Ukrainian cells, Ukrainophile organizations, publications, institutions, etc. And there are two major intellectuals to consider and remember. Uh, one of them is the aforementioned uh, uh, Dramanov, um, the tutor to the Ukrainian philosopher Ivan Franko, which later gives his name to a prominent uh, state within Ukrainian Galicia. And the second, Mikhailo um, uh, Rushevsky, uh, who we'll return to later. Both of these intellectuals arrived to teach at the University of Lemberg, which will later become Lvov or Lviv. Out of the old um, Holom um, Holomada socialists, uh, Dramanov established the Ruthenian Ukrainian Radical Party, the first political organization to utilize the term Ukraine. In 1899, uh, Sheptisky, the Metropolitan of Galicia, embraced the cause of Ukrainian nationalism for, for the first time among the uh, the Greek Catholic Church, purging the clergy's ranks of the various Russophiles. Galicia, by 1900, was uniquely situated as both a potential Polish and Ukrainian Piedmont. And what I meant by that is a term I've used quite consistently on this channel. Uh, a Piedmont is basically a smaller state, a nucleus, a political state uh, from which a greater sort of political unification can happen. Uh, so from the small state of Piedmont, Sardinia, Italy was able to be united, say, for example. So an independent Galicia could potentially be the vehicle to unite either Poland or Ukraine because it was the center of both sort of national aspiration, um, aspirationist groups. Um, politically sidelined within this whole scheme, the Russophiles, by con uh, comparison, became more radical. During the First World War, Russophiles were the targets of Austrian reprisals after many defected when the Russians overran the province of Galicia when I think it was in 1914 to, sorry, 1914 to 1915. Nicholas II had proclaimed that the Galicians were brothers that had languished for centuries under a foreign yoke and urged them to raise the banner of united Russia. Against, and again, he uh, supported the creation of various uh, uh, Ruthenian uh, paramilitary organizations to support this idea of a uh, Galician uh, repatrimony uh, with the Russian Empire. Against the Russian paramilitary organization established during the occupation, the Lusky uh, Druzhny, and again, Druzhny is this old term referring to the, the old sort of uh, horseback riders or the early nobility during the Kievan Rus. Um, the Austrian Ruthenians uh, established uh, by the Ukrainophiles established their own opposition organization, the Sich Riflemen. Uh, so they were Ruthenians fighting against Ruthenians. One was Ukrainophile, one was Russophile, both identifying you know, two different conceptions. One is to be a Ukrainian nationalist, one is to become part of this greater conception of Russia following in this outline of uh, pan-nationalism or unity and brotherhood between the peoples. Despite the region becoming the center of Ukrainian nationalism in the late 19th century, Russia would collapse before Austria-Hungary, and as a defeated power, Austria would lose Galicia to Poland, uh, though a brief West Ukrainian National Republic was established with the possible aim of unifying with the People's Republic out of the Russian Empire. When the provinces of Galicia um, and former Russian Volina were incorporated into the Second Polish Republic, Ukrainians became the largest ethnic uh, minority group within the Polish Republic. Various nationalist and militant organizations resisting Polish rule would coalesce in Galicia to form the OUN, or the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, which we'll come to again. Shortly after the Russian Revolution broke out, Soviets and members of the Ukrainian Democratic Party established a provincial government. Taking its lead from Galicia, the UDP, the Ukrainian Democratic Party, was founded during the Russo-Japanese War and rose to prominence as the Ukrainian branch of the cadets, constitutional monarchists and federalists, though it should be noted that the party was better received at first in Lemberg, um, uh, Lviv, rather than it was in what was now still Malorossiya. A central council was established in Kiev, led by a uh, Lemberg lecturer, and uh, again, coming back, uh, remembering these names, uh, Mikhailo uh, Ruzhevsky, who was now returning from exile from Austria. In July seven, uh, 1917, this council, or RADA, received recognition of autonomy from Kerensky's government in Petrograd, again, the new name of St. Petersburg post the reforms, uh, though for a much smaller core. So the idea of Ukraine as first conceived by Kerensky at least, was just pertaining to this idea around Kiev and Chernigov. Uh, 
after the October Bolshevik Revolution, a Bolshevik takeover of power in Kiev failed, and the Rava gave itself powers, still as part of Russia, uh, claiming control now over the governorates from Podolia to Kharkov, more or less corresponding to the modern borders of Ukraine, Sons Galicia, uh, with the intention to set up referendums in even further territories, what are now parts of Russia, like Volonezh and Kursk, to eventually join Ukraine. Despite not recognizing the Bolshevik governments, uh, the Bolshevik government, Ukraine did not declare independence. Nevertheless, the Bolsheviks declared the Rado as outlaws, invaded Ukraine, while the self-declared Donetsk uh, Kirovi Rog, uh, Socialist Republic in the Donbass, um, declared itself as an ally with the Bolsheviks. A separate Republic of Odessa was also declared um, its independence from Ukraine and its alliance to the Soviets. Only after the Soviet invasion did the Ukrainians declare independence, creating the first independent state of Ukraine on the 22nd of January 1918. To avoid being taken by the Soviets, the Rada accepted the terms of the German peace of Brestotovsk, a German puppet state for the purposes mainly of food extraction. Um, if you understand anything about the German home front, you'll know that food was the perennial problem due to the British blockade, and Ukraine was essentially the wheat fields and the extraction of the wheat fields in order to curb the uh, the growing dissatisfaction at home was a key strategic concern. Um, so the Germans were prepared to uh, ruffle feathers and uh, subordinate all of Ukrainians' national aspirations to this political, uh, to this uh, military aim. Other republics from the Don to the Caucasus were also carved out of the Treaty of Brestotovsk. And the, uh, out of, again, this would have been the territory now of the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic. And the Kuban Republic, which is to the east of uh, Ukraine, briefly joined in also with Ukraine, establishing like a large Ukraine. German troops had already removed um, the Russians from the territory of Ukraine. Nevertheless, now in control of the country, the Germans staged a coup against the Rada and established the Ukrainian state under a hetman. Despite being a German puppet, um, and of course monarchist as opposed to Republican, um, it was completely opposed to the socialist policies and attempted reforms of the original Ukrainian nationalists. Nevertheless, the state was the first effective Ukrainian government in establishing order after the fallout from the Russian Revolution. The more radical uh, Ukrainian Socialist Revolutionary Party launched a partisan campaign against the Germans and against their Hetman state. Though the German defeat in the war ultimately ended the Hetmanate after an attempted collusion with the Russian monarchists to reform the Russian Empire against the Bolsheviks. The People's Republic was established under a new government, the Directorate, led by the Ukrainian Socialist Revolutionary Party, now part of the broader conflict of the Russian Civil War and later the Soviet-Polish War. Poland was resurrected and both Ukrainian republics, West and East, were partitioned between Poland and the Soviet Union, which for historical comparison roughly left Poland with the borders it had with Russia in 1793. The People's Republic was conquered by the, uh, the USSR, um, or rather, it still would have been the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic at this point. Um, and they therefore established successfully the Bolsheviks, the third uh, Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, um, which was founded in 1919 after two previous attempts failed, and uh, was finally recognized as the sole sort of Ukrainian state in terms of the territory by 1922. Thereafter, it became one of the founding states of the Soviet Union. The People's Republic went into exile and retained a government in exile, first under Hurevsky, uh, which, uh, interestingly enough, if you actually look into this, the People's Republic of Ukraine um, continues in exile to hold some sort of nominal um, claim over Ukraine uh, throughout the entire existence of the Soviet Union until 1991, where it opts to dissolve itself upon the, uh, the first sort of uh, independence of Ukraine from the Soviet Union. In the early 1920s, the Soviet Union formed a policy known as Kolonizatsiya, literally putting down roots, indigenization of peoples to their respective republics within the uh, Soviet Union. In Ukraine, this amounted to a policy of de-Russification, where all children, regardless of ethnicity, were taught Ukrainian. This was a Stalin policy, first outlined in his pamphlet Marxism and the National Question, while he was based in Vienna in 1913. Lenin adopted this policy in 1919 at the height of the Civil War in response to the almost universal opposition of the nationalities to the Sovnikom or the Central uh, Soviet government in Moscow. In addition to teaching local languages as part of this idea of uh, Natsoviti or nationality councils, non-Russians were promoted to the highest echelons of the local republics. In defense of this policy, Stalin declared to the 12th Party Congress in 1923, 
the great Russian chauvinist spirit, which is becoming stronger and stronger owing to the new economic policy, finds expression in an arrogant and disdainful and heartless bureaucratic attitude on the part of Russian Soviet officials towards the need and requirements of the national republics. The multinational Soviet state can become really durable, and the cooperation of peoples within it really fraternal, only if the, the survivals are vigorously and irrevocably eradicated from the practice of our state institutions. Hence, the first immediate task of our party is vigorously to combat the survivals of Russia, great Russian chauvinism, and do bear in mind this is Stalin who's saying this. The main danger great Russian chauvinism should be kept in check by, the Russians themselves, for the sake of the larger goal of building socialism. Within the minority nationalities, uh, areas, new institutions should be organized, giving uh, the state a national minority character everywhere, built on the use of nationality, languages and government and education, and on recruitment and promotion of leaders from the ranks of minority groups. On the central level, nationality should represent the Soviet Union nationalities. Uh, the theoretical basis of this, from their own view of socialism, um, is the idea that this would lead from uh, separate nationality cultures to a Soviet Marxist international culture. Meanwhile, in Ukraine, the churches were being destroyed, religion was being suppressed, science and art were made to conform with socialist principles. And nevertheless, albeit there was this expectation that all of these national republics through this new socialist culture would all conglomerate to serve the interests of this future internationalist Soviet state. Already, Stalin was reversing this policy despite his suggested aims, with the advocacy of socialism in one country in opposition to Trotsky, whereby the centralization of the state and of the securing of socialism domestically rather than internationally became the chief concern of the Union. All of this corresponded with the policies of collectivization, the five-year plan, and dekulakization. Uh, this is the latter policy, is of course the first policy is referring to uh, agrarian reform, uh, taking away private farmers and uh, creating collective farmsteads. The five-year plan, uh, talking about the um, uh, rapid industrialization uh, process of the Soviet Union, and dekulakization, the idea of going after the wealthy farmer, all these uh, petty bourgeoisie elements, to ensure some sort of leveling effect where the Soviet bureaucracy can rule completely unimpeded throughout the entirety of the Soviet Union. A culmination of these factors created the Holodomor famine in 1932, where roughly three to four million Ukrainians starved. And of course, I have here on the, the right an image of uh, uh, Lazar uh, Kaganovich, uh, who was one of uh, Stalin's chief lieutenants in terms of the execution of his uh, policies, his economic policies towards Ukraine, which were resulting in the Holodomor. Combined to this was the return to a policy of russification in Ukraine. Russians, residents in the republics had always resented the policy of a uh, kolonizatsia. Uh, again, do forgive me if I do occasionally make, I probably have made countless pronunciation errors because I don't speak Russian or Ukrainian, unfortunately. And added to that were concerns that the, the Ruthenian republics of Belarus and Ukraine could cede from the unions. Russian language from 1937 reacquired a preeminence and became compulsory throughout the Soviet Union, while Ukrainian and Belarusian officials were targeted by the Great Purge as potential fifth columnists. Russia became the elder brother in what was supposed to be a socialist family of nations. In 1939, the Soviets and the Germans dismembered Poland per the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, and the Soviet Union acquired regions uh, that were uh, essentially the Soviet Republic of Ukraine, acquired regions uh, such as Galicia and Volina, uh, which were now, Galicia in particular, was incorporated into the Ukrainian state for the first time, albeit it's still not uh, uniting all of the territories we see within modern Ukraine. And this comes on to... Uh, World War II and post-World War II. Within a month, and again, so within this time, we have the context of World War II, we have the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, we have the division of Poland into the what would become the Belarusian Ukrainian sectors and the general government and the Wachtgau in, uh, in Poland. Uh, Germany has conquered most of Europe up to this point, and now in 1941, it invades uh, Russia. Uh, with the operation named Barbarossa. Within a month of Operation Barbarossa, Hitler appointed Erich Koch as the Reich's Commissar for Ukraine, which was established in September of 1941. The Lviv-based Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, founded in opposition to the Polish Republic, attempted to utilize the invasion to declare the independence of Ukraine and gain German recognition. And this was rejected out of hand by the Germans, who were intent on placing the region under German civilian control.
Such a policy was in line with the German war aims for dismembering and ultimately destroying the Soviet Union, expanding German control to the Urals. Hitler had a particular obsession with the Gothic settlement in the Crimea, which would become Gotland, or the land of the Goths. The rest of Ukraine would be given over to economic exploitation, and increasingly as the war progressed, Ukrainians were sent back to Germany as slave labour in factories. A number of slave labourers, approximately 2 million, were utilised throughout the uh, duration of the war. In Ukraine, intellectuals such as uh, uh, Kubievich cooperated with the Germans and sponsored the creation of the 14th Waffen SS Grenadier Division, or the Galician Division, a Ukrainian SS detachment, which as Germany started losing the war from 1943, began targeting Poles at her uh, Hueta Pinichaka, uh, Pit Karmin, and Palikwawi. The Organization for Ukrainian Nationalists continued to struggle against the Germans to establish a presence in Kiev. The popularity of the OUN led to a brutal crackdown of the organization and sympathizers by the Germans, which divided the loyalties of the Wehrmacht. Many had pro-OUN sympathies. Removal from the central, uh, removed from central Ukraine, the OUN returned to Lviv and established a partisan movement which avoided destruction at the hands of the Germans and was instrumental in the massacre of the Poles in Galicia and Volina in an attempt to push the Ukrainian boundary as far west as possible. If anything else, this represents the tragedy of the conflict the, between the Poles and the Galicians, uh, the Ruthenians uh, within Galicia, which I was alluding to with the Austrian partition, is that this is where it goes. It and results essentially in a genocide committed here. Communist Ukrainian partisans in the east were supported by the Red Army. Operate, um, and uh, Red Army operations uh, essentially resulted in the German defeat at the Battle of Kursk and the major Soviet operation of Bagration, which reconquered essentially the entirety of Ukraine. And apart from the Courland pocket, the Germans were pushed out of the former boundaries of the Soviet Union. The OUN, however, continued their campaign against the Soviets in the Donbass until 1958. Though many of the elements resurfaced and reorganized, interestingly enough, after 1991, and they do have some bearing on what's going on today. The Ukrainian nationalists indirectly succeeded in their aim of extending the border at the expense of Poland, which in the west, uh, Ukraine reached the Kurzon line. In the south, the city of Ismail extending to the Danube. Uh, as you can see on this map here of the Ukrainian Reich's commissariat on the left, um, in compensation for what were called the... Uh, the Vienna Awards, uh, Romania had lost territory to Hungary and Hitler compensated the uh, Romanian allies by giving them territories in uh, Ukraine, which also consisted of the city of Odessa. Um, so the Ukrainian nationalists, again, uh, were ultimately successful, albeit indirectly, in achieving the unifications of all the people they claim to be Ukrainian, uh, which also for the first time now extended to the Russian people uh, in the Carpathian mountain regions, which invariably had been Hungarian. It was briefly part of Czechoslovakia. It was then Hungarian again after uh, the annexation, uh, sorry, the occupation of uh, Czechoslovakia and uh, turning into the protectorates of Bohemia, Moravia and the uh, puppet state of Slovakia. Uh, so, yeah, it is here in 1945 that we begin to see the modern territory of Ukraine. However, the war had cost the lives of roughly 7 million Ukrainians, and Ukraine had been subject to two scorched earth policies in both directions, destroying most of the Republic's industrial and agrarian infrastructure. Though some factories had been transported to the Urals and were you know, essentially spared uh, destruction. Ukraine was placed after the war um, of being in the unique situation among, alongside Belarus of being a constituent republic of the Soviet Union while possessing a seat on the United Nations General Assembly. And again, this was a concession that Stalin demanded as part of his ascent into the system of the United Nations. In 1954, after the death of Stalin, Crimea was awarded to the Ukraine after the Crimean Tatar population had been forcefully removed by Stalin in 1944 to Uzbekistan, where they remained even after the transfer for 45 years. Now, the estimated death toll of that is in the tens of not hundreds of thousands, and hundreds of thousands of Crimean Tatars were moved, and they have been slowly but progressively repatriated ever since. The award of um, Crimea to Ukraine uh, was timed to coincide, interestingly enough, with the 300th anniversary of the uh, uh, Pereyaslav Council um, and was essentially sold to the Ukrainians as proof of this idea of brotherly love. 
as constitutes of the constituents of the union. But again, it's part of this idea of how does one represent this historical event of the uh, Pereyaslav Council? Does one mark it as the inception of Ukrainian national identity? Or does one mark it in terms of this inception of this brotherly union between the little Russians and the great Russians? And very much in this case, historical uh, Soviet historiography is favoring the latter reinterpretation of a union uh, rather than independence. Uh, this uh, reward also heralded the beginning of the Soviet thaw, or the gradual um, liberalization of rule um, in the Soviet Union, uh, which again accelerated uh, after Khrushchev, who had been party leader in Ukraine, uh, and after which um, he rose uh, to get rid of Beria, to get rid of Malenkov, to get rid of Molotov, uh, other people who were seen as far more likely uh, to succeed Stalin. And um, it is here which he initiates the secret speech, which is essentially a condemnation of Stalin's legacy and his cult of personality. As part of this uh, process of de-Stalinization, uh, the policy of Ukrainianization, or again, part of this idea of colonization, uh, was revived. And many of Ukraine's Communist Party were promoted to the Politburo, whose members by the time of Brezhnev, a Ukrainian, uh, pulled off his coup against Khrushchev. Um, Ukrainians at that time represented a majority of the Politburo. Under the rule of Brezhnev, Andropov and Chernenko, the Soviet Union's nationality policy would lurch from Ukrainianization to centralization, whereby supposedly in final stage communism, nationalities would finally cease and create the international Soviet state as indicated earlier by Stalin. But this abolition of the republics was never attempted. And here it comes to the end game of uh, Soviet Ukraine. In Ukraine, the rise of Brezhnev coincided with a renewed campaign of Russification Again, interestingly enough, we have the ascendancy of the Ukrainians in terms of the personages, uh, but a renewed camp uh, campaign of Russification ensues. And this time it's uh, taken under the party secretary who uh, rules Ukraine from 1972 until 1989, uh, uh, Shehebitsky, um, in a reversal of the Ukrainian policies implemented under his predecessor, Shelyest. Uh, feelings of, and again, according to uh, Shelabitsky, feelings of the brotherhood of the various nations were to be expressed in accordance with the people and language of the revolution and Lenin, the language of unity against which uh, Shelabitsky uh, deemed his opponents Ukrainian bourgeois nationalists and potential Zionists. Ukrainian language schools and press were scaled back, while Ukrainian nationalists and intellectuals faced mass arrest. A bitter opponent of Gorbachev, as one of the most conservative members of the Politburo on the topic of perestroika, uh, Shezhebetsky declared, uh, what fool invented this word perestroika, with perestroika literally means reconstruction. Why rebuild the house? Is there anything wrong in the Soviet Union? We are fine. What is there to rebuild? It is necessary to improve, reorganize. But why are the houses not falling apart? Why does it need to be rebuilt? Under his rule, Ukraine witnessed the Chernobyl disaster, but perhaps more relevant here is that he remained one of the communist leaders most opposed to Gorbachev. As a result of, as a result of this, perestroika was never introduced in Ukraine, while the relaxing state of, uh, the relaxing of uh, state censorship associated with this idea of glasnost um, was beginning to undermine Soviet authority. This at a time when the Soviet economy was already ailing and trust in Soviet institutions had been significantly undermined by the Chernobyl disaster. In September of 1989, Gorbachev deposed uh, Shezhebetsky as party boss in Ukraine, replacing him with his ally Vladimir Ivashko, uh, leading to the first multi-party elections in the Soviet Union. Ivashko resigned to become Gorbachev's replacement as general secretary and was replaced um, by Leonid Klavchuk, you can see here on the right. After the failure of the Soviet coup attempt by hardliners, and again, this was the coup of August of uh, 1991, uh, the main sort of interest of the perpetrators of the coup, uh, again, sort of uh, wanting to return more to the situation of Andropov, Chernenko, and uh, Brezhnev, uh, was to preserve the union and to reverse Gorbachev's uh, liberalization policies. Um, it is immediately after the attempted coup that Kravchuk you know, potentially sensing where the political direction was going, leaves the Communist Party, becomes an independent, and assumes the nominal position of Ukraine's first president. And a couple of days later, after the failed coup, there is the unilateral declaration of independence on August 24th. Um, thereafter, 
uh, Kravchuk is elected as president on the 5th of December 1991 alongside an independence referendum in Ukraine that voted 92% to 8% to secede from the Soviet Union. Uh, three days later, Kravchuk signed the uh, Belovezh Accords alongside Yeltsin and the chairman and prime minister of Belarus, declaring that the Soviet Union had effectively ceased to exist. And the Supreme Soviet voted itself out of existence on Boxing Day of 1991. Now, in terms of a summary there, because I'm not going to go further, you know, in terms of more recent history, that would be a stream in itself. But I hope I have at least given um, an indication of the fraught and complicated nature in trying to discern some element of a consistent Ukrainian identity or where such a thing would come from and why such a thing would arise and who essentially was, you know, who were responsible for sponsoring this idea. And uh, interestingly enough, again, is that throughout this entire period of history uh, where I've been talking about the idea of Ukraine really, since even before 1187 until 1991. It is only in 1991 to 1992 that we see the beginning of a nominally independent and sovereign state, albeit you can uh, debate as to what extent that is ultimately true. So again, I hope that has been at least uh, moderately informative in terms of um, outlining this. It's been a, an exhausting uh, topic for me uh to research and and try and gauge and weigh through and trying to find something which is um uh somewhat objective i hope uh so without further ado as usual um if you have a question leave it uh for me now and i will get and see if we have any super chats but uh, uh do so so there isn't an awkward silence anyone sort of uh, at your keyboard quickly write me a question so i can answer it right Let's get to the super chats. Give me a second. Okay. Uh, John Hawkins for two pounds. Uh, what is Fed posting? And that's not a question I'm going to answer, John Hawkins. Thank you for the two pounds. Pelinor Whitestrake for um, eight pounds and 99 pence. I confess I do not know much about the and again, thank you very much, Palin and White Strake. Um, I can see you in the chat. You're a consistent supporter of the channel, so thank you so much. Um, I confess I do not know much about the Cossack peoples, other than they are some sort, uh, sometime pro Moscow and sometimes not. Uh, where are they now, and what is their general influence on Russian history? Well. Like I said, you know, to my understanding, the Cossacks are, they come out of this situation uh, where they essentially form these uh, self-governing military communes or the Sitches, Sitchi, um, in, in this no man's land on the, uh, the wild fields uh, which separate Ukraine, the Ukraine in its geographic sense, uh, from the Tataria. And in this sense, um, if you look at uh, uh, Bodan Kemelinsky's um, original uh, revolt, this was essentially formed out of the interests of that local community, which remained you know, staunchly orthodox um, in their identity throughout, and resisted any sort of a overweening influence from the Catholics, but also wanted to um, prevent the region being overrun by uh, uh, Crimean and Turkish slavers. So in that sense, again, that's, that's what they are in terms of my understanding of this, in terms of um, uh, what happened after um, during the Soviet Union, and again, talking about the contrast, because someone is quite rightly saying they're not an ethnic group. They're not an ethnic group. Um, and uh, because you know, many people assign the Cossacks as part of the Ukrainian national identity, but they really are these uh, military communes which were established in this uh, very specific period in time uh, where Ukraine, the Ukraines of Russia and Poland were being assaulted by the Turks. So again, it's important to understand that they were like essentially the, the what they were operating in the Wild West equivalent of Russia compared to operating as a, an ethnicity or a state, uh, which is why I think it's so much of a misnomer uh, to go back uh, 
and claim that uh, they were the beginning of this uh, Ukrainian nationality. And I think that is all the more emphasized by what someone has very adroitly said in the uh, the chat, uh, which I really should have actually incorporated and missed in my lecture, come to think of it. Uh, it's something I really should have mentioned. But nevertheless, it was an hour and a half long and I've already lost my voice. Um, but the point I was going to make is that the Soviets, whilst uh, sponsoring this idea of Ukrainian nationality, at least in the 1920s and the 1960s, um, they followed a policy of de-Cossackization, um, de uh, which was more or less consistent with the fact that so many Cossacks went over and supported the whites during the Russian uh, Revolution. And they were very prevalent in the Lower Don region, and they were very prevalent within Ukraine and supporting of the white movement. And as a result, this also coincides with the general attack on aspects of the Ukrainian identity which aren't conducive uh, to this uh, Soviet model. The irony being, of course, that uh, Ukrainian uh, simps or sympathizers uh, are really born out of this love or obsession with the you know, self-governing traditions of the Cossacks against the control of a czarist autocracy. Uh, so, and again, in terms of where they are now, um, the, the attacks on the Cossacks were lessened uh, during Perestroika and they were allowed to assume some form of their, um, their traditions and they have now, there are people I believe, uh, claiming a Cossack ethnicity um, as separate and as wedded to these traditions. Um, even though they're less of an ethnicity in terms of you know, strict ethnicity and they, they come out of these self-governing communes, they're more inheritors of tradition uh, than they are an ethnic group. Uh, they are a community, but they're not necessarily an ethnicity. And I do believe there are hundreds of thousands of people who would associate themselves with this identity of a Cossack identity, so they're still around. Um, and they are sort of important to understand this inception of what it is essentially to be uh, Ukrainian. Anyway, even if that's a rather a post hoc justification, considering the idea really comes about in the 19th century as well. Um, Lawton Wynn for $5 just says hi. Uh, well, thank you very much for the $5. Um, hi back. Um, Bolero 393 uh, for 499 US dollars. Uh, thanks for the stream, AM. Uh, wish the Romanovs had been able to hold on. Yeah, well, I, I don't really think with. I mean, I've always contended that uh, the Romanovs could have held on uh, were it not for the cowardice of the Tsar's brother, Michael. Um, had, uh, had Michael um, been uh, willing to accept the responsibility of being Tsar, um, and, and someone is saying Cossack or Kulak. Kulaks are uh, peasant, are, pe pe are you know essentially bourgeois peasants or landed peasants. Cossacks are completely different. Um, but you know, I believe that had Michael uh, been proclaimed as Tsar of Russia and had he accepted the responsibility rather than awaiting to be elected, and again, I, I hate this modern idea of a, a, a you know almost this revival of an ancient idea of waiting for a modern democratic assembly to you know elect you as Tsar. He should have assumed responsibility because had he assumed responsibility, then the Romanovs would have been able to ensure that the more moderate conservative elements under um, uh, Rodzianko and uh, Lvov and the, uh, the first um, Duma uh, would have held on uh, rather than the socialist revolutionaries. And had the communists attempted a coup, um, there would have been a much stronger basis of conservative support for the regime, unlike the Kerensky regime, which was assailed from both the left and the right. However, um, there's also the important uh, point to consider that in order for Michael to have survived, he probably should have um, ended the war. Uh, because even though there are some people who have made the, made the claim um, that... Russia could have presumably actually won the war in 1917. I don't believe that at all. Um, Russia could have held on, but already by 1917, the goodwill and the effect of the incompetence of the Russian government and the home front had already done its damage. And the army had ceased to be a loyal organization. And it was the army who betrayed on Tsar Nicholas II as the army who deposed him. 
it wasn't the protesters and the rioters in uh, St. Petersburg in March of 1917, it was the army. So um, it was in a difficult position, but I do believe there was an avenue for the Romanovs to hold on. And I believe they collapsed due to cowardice because there was someone who could have taken the throne after Tsar Nicholas II. Um, even having Tsar Alexis, even had he only lived for about a year, um, would have probably been a better position in terms of legitimizing the provisional government post, uh, uh, post Nicholas II, uh, but alas, no. Uh, lost for words, thank you very much, for five pounds. Um, no questions, just to thank you for doing the stream to help people understand the complex history of Ukraine. Well, yes, I mean, part of the reason I also did it is not just for your benefit, it's also for my benefit. Um, I, 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 I fatter myself that I, uh, I knew a bit of Ukrainian history, but I, I think in terms of trying to understand and put this in the context of a narrative is really important in order to identify, you know, a thread of history in which you can actually begin to build and uh, develop uh, your understanding of this topic. And of course, because uh, Ukraine existed for most of its history as a region, and has only in the context of the 20th century become a nation. Therefore, trying to assign some precedent to it is incredibly difficult. Nevertheless, I've tried to navigate through it and uh, contrast it with this idea of uh, placing Ukrainian identity within this context also of its uh, relationship to Russian identity as well, and the contrasting uh, aspirations of polonization and russification. Uh, so I hope that's been uh, somewhat informative. Uh, Pelennon Whitestrike again. Uh, no problem for the support AM. There are many history channels on YouTube, but nothing like yourself and depth and honesty. Have a good night. Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, honesty, I hope, in a good sense, uh, not disarming honesty or honesty to the point of stupidity, I hope. Um, but yeah. Anyway, I'll go back over and look at the questions now. Uh, the Cossacks really didn't exist as a separate ethnic group from the Ukrainians and Russians anymore because of the Soviet policy of the Ukos. Yeah, well, like I said, they didn't really ever exist as an ethnic group, or rather as a, a culture inheriting the traditions of the Cossack self-government. Um, they weren't like the uh, the various peoples of, um, of uh, well, there are so many Russian nationalities who actually qualify as ethnicities. Uh, if you look at the, um, uh, the groups, uh, especially east of the Volga River, um, but the Cossacks aren't one of them. Right. Okay, I think unless someone's going to fire me a question now, um, that's probably going to be it for me this evening. Um, thank you all. Uh, calling Cossack an ethnic group would be like calling a cowboy or a gacho an ethnic group. Uh, I think the Cossacks have sort of more the greater sort of strand of tradition than the cowboys do. They have a longer history, um, but they have a longer history. But yes, it's, it's the same essential principle. They've inherited a tradition, but they're not an ethnicity. Um, right. That's going to be it for me this evening. Uh, I'm surprised I've actually survived doing this, but there you are. Um, this is my third stream in a row, and tomorrow I will be back uh, to discuss the reign of Catherine the Great and Peter the Great and Russia's westernization. Also, do check out that stream because all of this is relevant. All of orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality is going to be relevant, and this really should serve, like I said, uh, so it's part of heterodox history, but it's an addendum to um, the main history series. Uh, but this allows me to focus on the question of the Ukraine versus Ukraine. Uh, Melephis999 has asked me, did you read uh, Victims of uh, Yalta for today's show, Apostolic Majesty? No. I read Victims of Yalta a long time ago, but not in particular for this uh, this show. Uh, this was actually, I had I have very little time to do this, unfortunately. So um, uh, my, my reading is probably not as uh, extensive as it should have been, nevertheless. Um, uh, I, I pride myself on being able to research topics rather quickly. Um, right. Okay. That's it for me this evening. Thank you all very much for listening. Thank you to those who have sent super chats and good night. <laughs>